Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 3rd of October, 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. We're delighted to be joined by Mark Anderson, Stop the Presses, and also from the Chief Executive Officer of Strategic Defence Initiatives, David Ellis. But uh, good news in the future, Mike, because life's going to be different and we're all going to love it. Well, it absolutely is. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the Global Parliament of Mayors. Now, the uh, UK column wrote an article about this back in 2016. Anybody wants to go and have a look for it? The Global Parliament of Mayors and the abolition of the electorate is, uh, is what it's called. And they're saying it's saying the uh, overall objective of the internationalists is the undermining of the independent, self-governing Westphalian nation states. Uh, and its system of governance replaced by a new order more favourable to them. Now, a few days ago, we were talking about uh, uh, Monsieur Macron. Uh, here he is. Uh, he was talking at the U United Nations General Assembly, saying, today we're seeing a far-reaching crisis, a crisis of the Westphalian world order of the past. This world order failed in regulating itself economically, financially, and climate change, for example. And he was talking about setting up a new world order based on uh, law and so on. I'm not convinced that I've witnessed France uh, obeying or worrying too much about law. But anyway, we, we move on. Uh, Global Parliament of Mayors, then, this is, uh, is a quote from uh, Isaias uh, Johannes van Artsen, uh, the mayor of The Hague, saying, in this era of interdependence, where nation states are increasingly dysfunctional and cities are everywhere rising, the moment has come for cities to take the leap from effective local governance to true global governance. And this is the sentiment of the people that have uh, set up the global parliament of mayors. It seems to be the sentiment of Emmanuel Macron. Uh, but what's interesting is it's not the sentiment of Donald Trump, as we also mentioned a couple of days ago uh, when we were talking about his speech uh, at the United Nations General Assembly. So this is, uh, this is where we're at. Uh, why are we mentioning it now? Well, we're delighted to announce that the Global Parliament of Mayors is holding its 2018 annual summit in Bristol uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and, uh, well, Mark, you welcome to the program, uh, Mark Anderson. Uh, you wanted to highlight this, uh, and uh, maybe we can get somebody to go along to it. Oh, absolutely. As you guys know, I've been following the Global Cities Movement and the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate Change, and they're all related. And this is right in you guys' backyard, so I sent this on for today. And I'm glad that you put those quotes up there, especially Mr. Macron. Uh, you'll notice that he said that the Westphalian nation states failed to uh, the Westphalian, Westphalian nation state failed to regulate itself. I, I like those words, failed to regulate itself, when in fact the regulation of the nation states by the banking cartel, by the banking consortium, is what has uh, shattered those nations and made them economically dependent on central banks and their debt-based money system and depleted the basic sovereignty because governments are in control somewhat of their legislatures, somewhat of their executive branch, somewhat of their judicial branch, but the monetary, the all-important fourth leg of the stool, the monetary part, is completely privatized. And that's what's been regulating the nation states and depleting their sovereignty and uh, making them into this amorphous mass of a world government. So for, for the, him to say that governments are failing, uh, these nation states failed to regulate themselves, what they did is they failed to get a handle on the monetary power. They failed to regulate that. And in turn, the monetary power regulated the nation states. It turned everything on its head. So Mr. Macron's words are, are, are very, very cryptic, and I think he really knows what's going on. He's just using the same verbal gymnastics to fool the average listener. Uh, and I'll just move on to say that the announcement about the uh, Bristol meeting of the Global Parliament of Mayors, they're saying this is going to be their best one ever. I'll read a little bit of their press release, the main press release. More than 80 mayors from African, Asian, European, and U.S. cities have already confirmed that they'll be taking part. They'll be focusing on new ways to collaborate and ensure that city networks are collectively heard within international frameworks. There's that cryptic language, such as the UN's Global Compact for Migration. And migration is particularly interesting because along with that, they're saying they're very interested in global health and global security, and they want to prevent 21st century pandemics. And yet they say things like this. Together, we, these mayors, will explore ways in which we can ensure that migration is a force for good 
and that city leaders' voices feed into an international uh, agreement compact about migration. And then they go on to say, quote, we will explore how city leaders can improve public health and be prepared for 21st century pandemics and discuss collaboration to increase urban security before voting in parliamentary fashion on key priorities that will that we will commit to tackling collectively. Now, when, when you talk about migration, you're talking about a word that means the unmitigated traveling of people or, or even things and animals. Animals migrate. They're not regulated. Birds fly across borders. They're called migratory birds. When you say migration as opposed to the word immigration, then you're talking about a largely, if not totally, unregulated movement of people. Well, how are you going to control disease or the spread of disease and control pandemics, much less urban security, if you believe in largely unregulated or totally unregulated migration of people? This is typical of these contradictory concepts that these eggheads bring up. And it's just troubling that they get away with this dodgy language that uh, if you take a little time, you can just kind of take it apart and you see what they're really talking about. So we're going to get a lot of intensification of the Global Cities program coming up here in Bristol. Maybe we can get somebody on the ground to cover it. Um, I'll be looking into the press credentials for the event just to see how it works, if anything else. But this will this will follow through on what I've been covering in Chicago and elsewhere in the UK this past spring as well uh, when I was there on Global Cities. So we'll see how this turns out. But it looks like it's more of the same deceptive way of getting themselves insinuated in, in international groupings and, and in national policy and acting like they, they just want more local control. And I'll, I'll, I'll note this as I sum this up. As part of the summit program, the mayor of Bristol, Marvin Rees, will host the first formal meeting of the UK's core cities program, combining, and this is combined authority of the Metro mayors and representation from the mayor of London's office. That's another major announcement. Um, so this is the Global Parliament of Mayors. And my first question, Brian, is uh, who elected them? Well, of course, nobody. Nobody, Nobody elected them. But can I just add that um, for viewers and listeners who perhaps are new to this subject, the thing to remember is whilst there's discussion going on about global um, creation of mayors who are relating to each other on a global basis, cities in UK have been pushing and pushing this policy to set up the position of mayor for many years now. So originally that was undeclared. It was all just pushed across as though it was a good idea. Now we're seeing that actually this is part of something on a global basis, democracy pushed aside. This is very sinister. Democracy really is dead, is one comment in the chat box. Well, uh, not quite, uh, but we'll come on to that now. now. Of course, we were mentioning uh, Donald Trump's response uh, to globalization uh, as expressed at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, this is part of his quote. Uh, this is uh, why America will always choose independence and cooperation over global governance, control and domination. I honor the right of every nation in this room to pursue its own customs, beliefs and traditions. But the key point here is, of course, global parliament of mayors is one expression of this global governance policy, uh, which we're seeing. Uh, and, uh, well, I uh, I wanted to, to sort of com compare and contrast Donald Trump's position uh, with Theresa May. Uh, so this was Theresa speaking at the uh, at Davos, uh, at the World Economic Forum's annual Davos meeting in February 2017. And she said, uh, we are all united in our belief uh, that that world would be built upon the foundations of free trade, partnership and globalization. Uh, so that was her position there. Um, but I think this was probably the last time I saw her uh, giving a presentation which was which she was attempting to be attempting to be optimistic. So let's just have a look at what she was saying. The United Kingdom, a country that has so often been at the forefront of economic and social change, will step up to a new leadership role as the strongest and most forceful advocate for business, free markets and free trade anywhere in the world. For that is the unique opportunity that Britain now has. I speak to you this morning as the Prime Minister of a country that faces the future with confidence. 
For a little over six months ago, millions of my fellow citizens upset the odds by voting with determination and quiet resolve to leave the European Union and embrace the world. It was simply a vote to restore, as we see it, our parliamentary democracy and national self-determination. A vote to take control and make decisions for ourselves. And crucially, to become even more global and internationalist in action and in spirit too. So at the heart of the plan I set out earlier this week is a determination to pursue a bold and ambitious free trade agreement between the UK and the European Union. But more than that, we seek the freedom to strike new trade deals with old friends and new allies right around the world as well. So that was uh, almost two years ago, Brian. Uh, and uh, well, I wanted to compare that, the rhetoric from Theresa May there, with a speech that Donald Trump gave yesterday. Um, because Trump was, of course, he's on the campaign trail uh, in the US for the midterm elections. Uh, and he was speaking to the National Electrical Contractors Association in Philadelphia. So have a listen to this. We have the best economy in our history. Stock market today just hit another record high. That's the 100, I think it's 103 times since I'm president that we've hit a new high. And hopefully next year at this time, we'll hit many more. But that's not a bad number, right? I think we're up to 103. And if I'm off just by a little bit, like if it's 102, it'll be headlines. Trump exaggerates. <laughs> so I always say, I think it's around. With a Republican Congress, we've added more than 4 million new jobs since Election Day and lifted four million Americans off of food stamps. Those are tremendous numbers. <laughs> Jobless claims are at a 50-year low, and the stock market, as I just said, is at an all-time high today. African-American, Hispanic-American, and Asian-American unemployment rates have all recently achieved their lowest levels ever recorded. That's pretty good. We're also fixing decades of disastrous trade deals that have plundered our factories and stolen our wealth and our jobs. What's happened here over the last 20, 25 years and more is horrible. But we're changing it all. We've added 400,000 new manufacturing jobs since the election, and that number very shortly will be up, David to 640,000. Big things are happening currently. <laughs> and if you remember, the past administration said, those are jobs that you're not going to be adding. Uh, you're going to need a magic wand. Do you remember that magic wand? There was no magic wand. It's good policy and other things. We're in the midst of a manufacturing renaissance, something which nobody thought you'd hear, which means more jobs for our great electrical contractors. Yesterday, we made history by announcing an incredible brand new trade deal to replace the horrible NAFTA deal that drained our country of jobs and companies. As I've said many times, <laughs> NAFTA was one of the worst trade deals ever made in any country at any time. And now we have a great trade deal. And we have a deal that's also good for Mexico and good for Canada. We have a good partnership with the three. And it worked out. It all worked out. As you probably noticed and read and saw, there were a little tough negotiations. But you know what? It all worked out. And we're now on the right track. And we did a great deal with South Korea. It's all working out. Now, as you probably have heard, we're looking at China and other countries. And we're straightening out some of these horrible deals that stole our wealth, stole our jobs, stole so much from us. Actually, in many ways, stole our dignity as a country. So 
Right. Now, I, that was quite long, and I, I, but I don't really apologize for that because he made a number of really important points here. First of all, focusing on uh, manufacturing, on productivity, focusing on farming, uh, focusing on building, taking down the, inf the institutions that don't work. This is, reflects what he said at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, he absolutely went after the World Trade Organization on that, at that uh, event uh, during that speech, and particularly the dispute resolution uh, situation there. Uh, and, and I'm comparing that with Theresa May, because Theresa May now has been saying for two years that global Britain, global Britain, we're going to create all these new trade deals with all kinds of people all around the, around the world. Uh, but Theresa May, with her globalization stance, it seems to be not reaching any trade deals with anybody, uh, not even the European Union, um, uh, whereas Trump seems to be making trade deals with all kinds of people. Uh, and so there seems to be something strange going on here. Um, he mentioned the fact that, uh, that uh, there had been problems with uh, getting the, the replacement for NAFTA through. Well, this is true because uh, Justin Trudeau was, was pushing back on it very hard in a number of areas. He said this, no deal is better than a bad deal. I wonder where we've heard that before. Uh, we seem to be getting that out of uh, uh, quite a number of people on this side of the Atlantic. But anyway, he said, uh, and we've made it very clear to the president, we're not going to move ahead just for the sake of moving ahead. Well, in fact, they ended up making moving ahead on Friday. Uh, and uh, so Trump uh, had this to say about it. We had very strong tensions. It was, un it was just an unfair deal, uh, whether it was Mexico or Canada. And now it's a fair deal for everyone. It's a much different deal. It's a brand new deal. It's not NAFTA redone. So it's not NAFTA redone. He said, let's have a look at what it is. Uh, they're, talking, they're talking about protectionism on uh, dairy products uh, relaxed, so uh, farmers get a better deal, apparently. Car manufacturing, uh, no more cheap car manufacturing outside of the United States. Uh, and the same for uh, car parts, so everybody requires to have proper wage levels. So there'll be tariffs on anybody trying to manufacture. Uh, outside the United States or Canada. So if you want to send the manufacturing to Mexico where wages are cheaper, there will be tariffs uh, and uh, steel and aluminium tariffs will remain. Uh, the key thing for me uh, was dispute resolution. Uh, and he caved in a little bit because he accepted that Chapter 19 of NAFTA should stay. Now, Chapter 19 uh, was this uh, uh, independent, so, so supposedly independent court of arbitration, which would deal with disputes between the nations, and it was representatives of the nation states uh, who would be on that court. Uh, that stays. But what they did throw out was the mechanism for corporations to sue governments, and this was the main problem with, for example, TPP or TTIP that people were concerned about. So again, let's compare it to Theresa. She said, uh, if you remember back in that, uh, that speech last year, but more than that, we seek the freedom to strike new trade deals with old friends and new allies right around the world as well. Uh, well, what has Liam Fox been doing? That's what I want to know. Uh, he says he's been really busy, but I don't see any evidence whatsoever for it. So, uh, Mark, uh, let me bring you back on here. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on the situation with Trump? What are your thoughts on the economic situation with the United States? And what, do you, what are your thoughts on this uh, replacement for NAFTA? Is it what he says it is? It seems to be in most respects. It was September 30th, of course, that the U.S. Trade Representative Office announced with various press releases that they had reached this agreement. Uh, they call it, of course, formally the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA. And they're saying it'll advance, as you noted, Mike, U.S. agricultural interests like dairy, and create more markets for America's farmers, ranchers, and agribusinesses, I'm reading from a press release, and to expand U.S. food and agricultural exports and support food manufacturing and rural jobs. They're talking about um, 325,000 American jobs are, are supported through the exports of agriculture, something like that. And lots of things to report, uh, probably beyond the scope of today's show, but as you noted, they're going to try and drive higher wages by requiring that 40 to 45 percent of auto content be made by workers making at least $16 an hour while incentivizing new vehicle and parts investments in the U.S. Re related to autos. Um, if, you, if you look at these kinds of things to keep wages higher 
and as you say, to at least massage dispute resolution a little bit and make it a little bit better, a little bit more in favor of the nation state. And if you look at those details, it does look like a pretty good thing. One thing I picked up from the Canadian press is that the tariffs on aluminum and steel, while they will remain, are under negotiation uh, on, on a separate track and that talks to lift the tariffs to, to remove them are ongoing, according to the CBC in Canada. So those tariffs could be a little flimsier. They, uh, they might not last or maybe they'll be pared down a little bit. So you begin to get a mixed bag. It's interesting as a footnote that the Canadian uh, Foreign Minister, Christia Freeland, who's Canada's chief negotiator in the in this NAFTA 2.0 that really is replacing NAFTA. NAFTA is 24 years old now. It was sired by George H.W. Bush, signed into law by Bill Clinton. It's a creature of globalism. It cut a lot of American manufacturing jobs by the millions. Uh, it de it deindustrialized America. So NAFTA is fading into the background and fading out of existence. That's huge news by itself after a quarter century of NAFTA. But uh, the side the sideshow uh, uh, concerning the Canadian minister, Christia Freeland, she noticed that uh, uh, Mr. Lighthizer, the uh, the main U.S. trade representative uh, who has a populist pro pro national America first outlook uh, from his background. She gave him a book called The War That Ended Peace by Margaret McMillan to address some of Mr. Lighthizer, the U.S. trade representative's concerns. Uh, and the book's core message, according to the Canadian press, is that a prosperous, interconnected era of accelerated globalization came to a crashing halt, spiraling into a vortex of protectionism and nationalism that culminated in the most murderous three decades in human history. So here you have the Canadian lead negotiator giving the U.S. lead negotiator a book about how globalization is good and nationalism and sovereignty is bad. And so uh, Canada also was leaking news behind the scenes prematurely about different chapters of this new agreement that's replacing NAFTA. So uh, good old Canada, a, a friendly neighbor of the U.S., was actually being kind of underhanded here in the background of all this and uh, trying to blame nationalism and populism for all the ills of the world when you guys and I know and, and many of your uh, news analysts that you have on your show, like Patrick Henningsen, all of us well know that it's forced internationalism, it's globalization that, that drives war or threats of war. You know, this never-ending brinkmanship between nations to get foreign markets because their home economies are so depleted from the banking cartel. We have a money drought in most individual nations, and that money drought, that lack of purchasing power, that lack of the need for a debt-free money system. Instead, we have a debt-based money system that drives countries to look for credits and income from foreign markets. If their domestic markets were healthier, we wouldn't need to have all this brinkmanship to search for foreign markets, and we wouldn't have all this uh, battling for these international treaties. But it's hard to, of course, arrest the influence of that money power, so nations settle for making trade agreements and they try to do the best they can. And I think the Trump administration, despite the underhanded efforts by Canada, I think the Trump administration has done the best it could to make at least a reasonably uh, pro-sovereign trade agreement out, out of this, but still give Canada and Mexico um, a fair deal. And so, uh, uh, Trump, sorry, sorry Trump Mark, I, I was yeah, just going to say a, a lot of people in the, uh, in the chat box commenting on the fact that the United States has a uh, continuing, continually burgeoning national debt, uh, and that uh, you know that is, hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, the point here is that, Mark, for me, the point is that the policy has changed. You can't deal with the national debt unless you unless you change your policy. He seems to be ch have changed his policy, or ch he seems to have changed the country's policy rather uh, to to return to one of national of pr productivity and and uh, and industrialization in the sense of, of uh, productive manufacturing and farming right. uh, and and re onshoring jobs and we're already seeing for example Apple uh, building uh, new factories uh, outside of China for the first time really uh, in quite a long time um, so this policy seems to be work working and bringing the jobs back onshore 
Um, and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, none of the other issues uh, of financial collapse or uh, national debt can be dealt with without that policy shift. And I think that's the main change here. Yeah, the 400,000 jobs that he says have been created in manufacturing since he became president, he told that to the electrical contractors in Philly, I think are real, and they consist of uh, some of the jobs you're talking about, Mike. It is true that if you reset the dials and you, re you reinvest, reinvest excuse me, in the U.S. industrial base and help Canada and Mexico lift their boats too, you do set the stage for the monetary reforms and the increase in revenue uh, the, the increase in the tax base that will help fund the roads, help fund the schools, rebuild the infrastructure. You do reset the dials in the way you're describing, Mike. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just that uh, eventually we need to tackle the monetary and the debt-based monetary, the debt-based money system, and then we would literally correct the world in uh, in terms of the way it's so out of balance right now. So we can always be cautiously optimistic, but what Donald Trump is doing is pretty positive across the board. There's a few areas to question. But it's certainly uh, uh, in in grave contrast to what Macron and Theresa May are saying. Absolutely, a uh, few areas, foreign policy being one of them. But anyway, uh, let's yes. let's move on. Uh, let's have a quick ad here for Media on Trial, uh, Part Four: The Russian Connection, coming up uh, in Liverpool on the twenty eighth of uh, October, uh, two p.m. to six p.m. That's a Sunday, uh, and the uh, keynote speaker is Andrei Nekrasov. Uh, who is a Russian filmmaker and director uh, who uh, wrote, or sorry, has produced this film uh, called The Magnitsky Act. I do recommend that people uh, have a look at that if they possibly can. Uh, that will be in the Blackie in Liverpool. Uh, do get along to it. Um, I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, and then uh, quickly tomorrow, just a reminder, tomorrow evening, uh, Ian Crane is in the studio. Humanity versus Insanity at, seven, at uh, 7.30. Uh, Dr. Graham Downing is his guest for that. Uh, and uh, at 9 p.m., Fracking Nightmare, and uh, he will be covering more on the uh, the three imprisonments of uh, of uh, three uh, fracking campaigners uh, last week. So uh, come and join us for that tomorrow evening uh, on ukcolumn.org forward slash live. Excellent. Well, let's move on to the subject of defence and Brexit. In fact, we can uh, look at both those in one swoop, as it were. And we need to go back a couple of days to the Bruges Group uh, meeting um, where um, Bruges Group themselves posted a film clip, uh, which we're going to have a look at part of that in just a moment and bring in David Ellis. Um, but I couldn't resist this. This is a clip. Uh, I was watching this video um, when they were asked about um, matters to do with defence and basically EU military unification. Um, the reaction from the panel was astonishing. So we've got Andrea Jenkins there, far right. Um, suddenly her hand went up to her mouth and it almost looks like she started to bite her fingernails. Pretty Patel laughed and threw her head back and started to stroke her hair, which I think is another sign of being slightly uncomfortable. Uh, and Owen Patterson sort of um, turned over his shoulder and sort of did a a sort of patronising smile. I couldn't resist uh, capturing this uh, still from that video. But let's have a, a listen to the clip that caused the problem. This is a lady in the audience who stands up and starts to ask questions about defence. Now, the quality of the video and the audio is very poor. That's not UK column, and that was the original video that was posted by the Bruges Group. Um, but let's uh, listen and watch that, and then we'll have some comment. Uh, from David Ellis. I thought for the campaign, Brexit, please don't, anyone, nobody will ever tell me, I didn't know what I was voting for Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to let you know that I campaigned to do hip operations, so it wasn't easy, but I did it. Now, I want to tell you and I'd like reassurance from all of you that I never want to see Europe, an undemocratically elected, to elected totalitarian, rule our defence system and take over our army, our navy, our airport, and more important, our decision as to whether we got to war there or not. I don't ever want to see that. We must retain our sovereignty and our control. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you.
Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. Um, well, thank you for going out on the streets. Um, you know, my mum was 75, she was doing the same um, to, you know, to come on the streets for, um, for Brexit. Um, I completely agree. Now, does anybody, have you heard the organisation, I don't know if David's here, Veterans for Britain? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They're doing some fantastic work. I had some sort of meetings with him myself and done some articles um, with them um, for various you know, online newspapers, etc. Um, unfortunately, since, um, as David will take on Veterans of Britain, unfortunately, since the referendum, the government has signed um, you know, um, papers which further integrate us and including money that we give to them as well. So they've been really trying to highlight this, so please look them up, you know, and write to your MP about this. Now, to me, I do not want to see a European army, and, 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 and I, I think under this concept is the Brexiteers here, we will never let that happen. That, you've got our reassurance from as Brexiteers. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to make sure that we um, ramp up our defence system. I'd like to see defence um, spending go back to the 1990 levels of 4% of GDP. So, no, I mean, we're alive. <laughs> during the campaign, but I think, you know, from the sentiment in this room, and this is not the first meeting to discuss Brexit that I've attended, I attended another event yesterday, and I can tell you we had many, many more people in that room than we, this room could actually hold. The sentiment is exactly the sentiment that you've expressed. People want to take back control. They want, to, they want the assurance that their government is not going to keep on going down that slippery slope. You know, surrendering basically money and powers, decision making. There's a huge irony to all of this. Us MPs spend a lot of time trying to get ourselves elected to Parliament. We get ourselves, don't we? We all seem to want to vacillate and then let someone else make decisions on our behalf. Well, actually, you know what? If we're a truly sovereign nation, then we should be taking control of those decisions. And I do think we stand at a crossroads in this country. We are at the crossroads now where we are trying to fight for exactly that, secure our future and ensure that no generation going forward um, of politicians and as well as people that stand and serve in our public services as well and across our country, you know, are subject to decision making by a third party. So, you know, we are... Uh, well, there we have it. Um, looking very uncomfortable. Then Andrea simply says, well, uh, there's a very nice man called David Banks, Veterans for Britain. Uh, uh, I think he's trying to do something about it. And as many people in our chat box have commented, pretty Patel simply waffles. David, this is very, very telling that this uh, group of MPs go wobbly at the mention of what is happening with our defence uh, Britain's defences at the moment and the European Union. Yes, indeed, very wobbly. Uh, and we've got to say that we're seeing a very consistent repeat pattern. Uh, I can concur with this on a personal level from the MPs and ministers I've met prior to Brexit, during the Brexit campaign and post the vote, trying to get this aired. And, and this is a terrific example here of just what's going on. And it's very fresh, obviously, because it's just happened. And it's exactly the same as what Justin found when he questioned David Davis and, Mark, and Farage um, last week at Bolton. So we've got waffle and obfuscation. We've got no real substance. We've got some really, really, frankly, some very odd comments here from Ms Jenkins. Unfortunately, since, um, since the vote, we've been signing papers to continue to integrate us. Now, those are really, really interesting words, aren't they? Because obviously, as we know already from the 48 clip that we've had in Cabinet, it's OK to integrate. So there's not a problem there. We're not we're OK with that. That's just being done. But we're not integrating, Andrea. We are unifying into single point con command and control of all of the defence services uh, in military union, in defence union. So that's 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 way off the mark. Um and we've got, uh, and, and, and we don't want to see this, but it's happening. She's saying we don't want it to see. Um, and we don't want it to happen. And we can assure you that it won't happen. Well, that isn't true, because it has happened. Because our troops were out in Sarajevo about a month ago with EU insignia on. It caused a bit of a stir. So even after that event, this is, this is just like there's no cognitive reality here. It's completely incoherent. 
And then she closes with this. Uh, we need to ramp up our defences. We need to increase spending. Well, that's really interesting because for 40 years, maybe more, 50 years, we have been conducting military unification under the guise of cutting. Cut, cut, cut. Every Tory government has cut. Cut, 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 cut. Well, they've actually been unifying, but they, don't, they can't use that word, can they? So I've got to say that this, this lady, I would love to know who she is. All credit to her for standing up and putting this question in, because it's perfect. What do we see? The panel utterly stall and crash like a crash like a stone into the ground and it's total and utter waffle from Pretty, Pretty Patel. And, and these are our MPs. Um, David, if I, not, David, if I can just come in uh, for those listening to the programme today, what happened was a lady stood up in the audience and simply said, uh, I don't want... Um, my country, um, you know, to go into an, uh, an EU military structure. Um, what's being done about this? It was quite a simple question, difficult to hear. And the reply, as you're describing, was one of complete bluster. They couldn't answer the question. They didn't want to ask the question. So let's bring in Steve Baker, because you picked up this uh, tweet. Uh, he says, Bruce Newsom is right. We're not talking about continuing UK EU defence integration because almost no one understands it. We're not talking about it because no one understands it. I'll help you along a bit here because this is the article on the UK column website, uh, which is to do with the paper which you led going into the Defence Select Committee. Um, so we're going to say, don't ever claim you were never told, Mr. Baker. But this is typical of the MPs. Uh, we don't know anything about it. Uh, if you tell us what's happening, we don't want to know. It's all too much trouble. Don't worry your little heads about it. Go back to sleep. It's astonishing. It is astonishing. Uh, I mean, where Mr. You know, Mr. Baker is one, one example of many MPs that I've been to to try and uh, get this talked about. And he, he, even if we'd got to the point where there was just one or two MPs prepared to speak about this and evaluate it, but there isn't even that. So we get these kind of very inverse comments. And, and Mr. Baker, there's quite a good example, because whilst he was prepared to take the scandal of the number 10 letter and the officer's names being taken in vain in the Brexit campaign, where we had various admirals and generals being put on a letter to support staying in the EU, which provoked a, a, a backlash because they weren't consulted. And we have then some speaking out. But the problem was, of course, is that the minute we said to them, this is about EU military union, he did not want to know. And in fact, he was quite blunt. You know, don't call me anymore. I'm not interested. You know, please go away. So for him then to come out subsequent to the scandals we've had since the German government tweet and the uniform scandal, to then say that nobody's un nobody understands this is just a ridiculous comment. And it is frankly almost as if now, because we've got a collective silence. And it's it, what, I, what, what I'm going to I'm going to sort of phrase this in terms of it's as if there is a political denotice on this subject. Now, that corroborates with what Admiral Lord Boyce told me at the very start of the Brexit campaign that the, the whole EU military union unification and this country's defence issues were being held separate from the vote leave agenda or the remain agenda completely. So we've got these MPs that are complicit to this, you know, denotice. I, I don't know what else to call it. Um, but these, act, these political actors and agents are just not talking about it. And I've got to say that the reaction that we're seeing there on stage it's exactly the same reaction that I found face to face with Nigel Farage. He'd run off and exactly the same reaction that I had with David Davis whilst he was a minister face to face opposite Downing Street. Um, at the point when I said we need to talk about the EU military uh, union, EU defence union, there was shock, horror, and he literally run off. So we're seeing a common theme here. But what is happening is, of course, is the public awareness is lifting. And we're challenging these people. And of course, at the point now we're challenging, we see the reality of actually what we've what we've got. Right, David, thank, thank you for that. Uh, let's just very quickly bring in this. This Sunday Express, 
This will have gone through, some people will have read it, they've already forgotten about it, but here's the Express revealed how Whitehall thought British public too stupid to be trusted with a decision to go into the EU. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about Foreign and Commonwealth Office document 30 uh, slash 1048. This was the document where Heath was told that if we went into the EU on the basis that was being uh, talked about, we would actually be getting rid of our sovereignty. Effectively, Britain would be uh, dissolving as a nation state. This was sedition. It was treason. Significantly, though, the Express didn't even put up the document. We, UK Column has shown it, and enormous credit to Dave Barmby, who was the man who found that document in the National Archives, a declassified secret document, if I remember correctly, and you can find that and all the details in his book. So to come back to you just for 10 seconds, David, um, basically we have seen the British government, a conservative government in the past, lie, deceive the British public, say in internal documents, the public are too stupid to be told the truth as to what we're doing. Is it any wonder where we're now in 2018 and the Conservative Party still lying to the British public and still deceiving the public over what's really happening with our military, which is that it's being fully unified with the EU system we're supposed to be leaving. It's treason, isn't it? Uh, that's a very good question. And it's a question that you're quite legitimately you know, able to submit. And that's for the general public to judge en masse, because it's a grand jury affair, it's our nation to judge us. But you're absolutely correct that the foundations for this are lies and deceit and propaganda for the whole EU uh, federal project that we've gone into, which includes our military. It goes hand in glove with currency union. Military union, it's the same, you know, it's as, as important. And we've got to get to the stage now where we realise is that these people are just deceiving us. They're not going to talk about this. They're refusing to talk about it. Pretty Patel's reaction there for somebody that's supposed to be a Brexiteer is completely inverse because surely if you wanted to leave the EU, you are not going to leave your military remaining in the EU because that's, a, that's just an absolute, that's insanity. That's just not coherent. It's insane. So surely as a Brexit uh, uh, MP, you would want those votes to support Brexit and you would get votes if you would, would talk about it. But you're not. So there's the contradiction. So, you, you know, you've got to say to yourself, are we dealing with some control point further within the in the party system that is preventing these people from speaking about it or they don't think or they're useful idiots or something? I don't know whether they think it, that they genuinely think themselves it's not important or we don't have to worry about it. But I've got to say we found the same with the Labour Party. And even with the chair of the Labour Party Brexit group, John Mills, told me personally this was not important, that our military isn't important and whether we have command of it isn't important because that's OK. We can give that to the EU. I mean, this is it's delusional. It's beyond it that. It appears delusional. Unless you come to the conclusion that there is a conspiracy across all the major parties to help this EU project go through. And if you're running a conspiracy, you need MPs who are largely kept ignorant, but you also want arrogance to dismiss concerns from the public. Let's come back to uh, Ms Patel to see what happened at that same meeting when a Guardian reporter asked a simple question about Theresa May. Um, time is running out before the final deal is done. Theresa May is committed to Chequers. She uh, reaffirmed that on Andrew Martin this Sunday. It's clear that you have no faith in Theresa May. It's clear you don't want her as leader. Why don't you just make the moves to get rid of her? Otherwise, why don't you just make the moves to get rid of her? Otherwise, why don't you just make Spineless winter. Andrew, <laughs> well, my letter was in, in July and I came public about it, and I was actually one of these working in the background with several of us trying to get more letters in. So the letters went in, unfortunately, not enough. 
Can I, I, I would just like to basically say, how dare you come here and criticise us for being spineless <laughs> So there we have it. How dare you come here and criticise us? Don't criticise MPs. Don't criticise us. We are beyond criticism. The arrogance in this woman, uh, David, is quite unbelievable. Absolutely. I mean, surely your role is to be challenged. Isn't it? Oh, am I missing something here? You know, it's a fiduciary role. You're there to represent. So you will, you will, as a matter of course, be challenged. So if you've got an MP that doesn't want to be challenged, you're dealing with something that's like it's totalitarian, in, isn't it, in, in nature? But there was a very specific reaction at the point that the man asked the question, why haven't you got rid of her? There was a real reaction on Priti Patel's face instantly to that. If you, if you want to go back and watch the clip again, you'll see it. As much as there was a reaction when the lady challenged them about um, military union. You know, uh, that these people can't, play, you know, it's absolutely, it's apparent, blatantly apparent. Yeah. Well, um, a few people saying, where can they see that clip? Go to the Bruges Group Twitter page and you'll find it embedded. I think it might be the pinned tweet at the top of the page, but certainly you'll find it on their Twitter page. Any last um, comments from Mark? Very quick, because we're on the stop for time. I would just concur that um, you have a real problem there with the accountability of these officials uh, not wanting the truth to get out about the unification of the military because that brings uh, to the forefront the lie or at least the grave exaggeration that Brexit is and the, and the masterful uh, deception that they're trying to pull over the wool, pull over the people that is. Uh, it, it really, it really uh, is that breaking point where they don't want the deception to come through uh, full bore. So they really have to just, you know, disassociate themselves from reality and lie and, and uh, dissemble and do everything they can to prevent the people from really knowing what's going on. And the fact that they, they would even address the Guardian that way is very telling since the Guardian is basically an establishment friend of theirs. So even the Guardian is shrugged off. Yeah. OK, thank you very much for that. Thank you, uh, David Ennis, also. Uh, there we have it. We're moving towards a, um, a system of global governance, rules-based international order based on city mayors created by people with the arrogance we've seen uh, operating inside the Bruges Group. Just uh, dangerous times, really. Thank you for joining us. We will be back at the same time on Friday. Bye-bye.